Hello friends, my name is Dr. Sayed Kazmi. You're watching my YouTube channel and today I'm uh, going to talk about uh, the new Pediatric Diabetic Ketoacidosis Guidelines 2020. Uh, these guidelines were released in um, April 2020 and they were released by the British uh, Society of Pediatric Endocrinology. So some of the things uh, in the management of pediatric uh, diabetic ketoacidosis uh, have changed, especially the diagnostic criteria, as well as the initial fluid management uh, guidelines, they have changed. And I will be briefly talking about all those changes um, in the next couple of minutes. So let's start uh, with the uh, first change. Uh, so uh, the first change is regarding the diagnostic criteria. So uh, it has changed the way we used to diagnose uh, diabetic ketosis uh, um, in the past. So the previous guidelines, uh, uh, they were that uh, you need to have a pH of less than 7.3 or a bicarbonate of less than 18 with a high uh, blood glucose levels. Now the new guidelines uh, released by the British Society of Pediatric Endocrinology, they say uh, that the bicarbonate should now be less than 15 millimoles per liter. So now you have to have a, uh, a pH of less than uh, 7.3 or you need to have a serum bicarbonate less than 15 millimoles per liter. And remember that the uh, previous guidelines used the criteria of 18 millimoles. So that has now been lowered to 15 millimoles per liter. So this is the very first change in the diagnostic criteria. And that brings the BSP the guidelines um, in conformation with the international guidelines uh, as well. Please keep it in mind that most of the times with this criteria, the blood sugar would always be high. It would be more than 11 millimoles per liter. But in, in pediatric sometime, uh, even in, in severe diabetic ketoacidosis, you will see that the blood glucose level is normal. So even if the blood glucose level is normal in a child who is known to be diabetic, if the um, if the pH is less than 7.3 or the bicarbonate is less than uh, 15 millivolts, and with that there is ketonemia as well, that the ketones are more than 3 millivolts per liter, then that confirms the, um, the, the definition of diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, now uh, the second uh, change is you know is, is regarding the uh, the severity of diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, in the previous guidelines, um, they were using the cutoff of uh, less than 7.3. So uh, the mild and moderate were clubbed together. So you had mild or moderate, and then you had the severe category. But now they have uh, made it much more elaborate. So the second change that has come in the best bet guidelines is that if your pH is uh, less than 7.3 or the bicarbonate is less than 15 then you uh, then the child is classified as mild diabetic ketoacidosis if the ph is less than 7.2 or the bicarbonate is less than 10 millimoles then we classify it as moderate diabetic ketoacidosis or if the ph is less than 7.1 or the bicarbonate is less than 5 then that would be classified as a severe uh, diabetic ketoacidosis so instead of the previous um, uh, definitions or, or categorizations of mild moderate and severe now we have got three categories that is the mild uh, dka the moderate dka and the severe dka and remember again for um, uh, mild dka the ph should be between uh, 7.21 to 7.29 or the bicarbonate should be less than 15 uh, for um, uh, what we call as moderate uh, diabetic ketoacidosis the ph uh, should be between 7. Uh, one and 7.19 or the bicarbonate should be less than 10 and for uh, severe diabetic ketosis doses the ph should be less than 7.1 so it could be anywhere any value be, be below 7.1 or the bicarbonate is less than 5 millimoles per liter so that would be classified as severe diabetic ketoacidosis so this is the second change now moving on uh, the, the third change is uh, regarding who are you going to call once you are confronted with a child who has got diabetic uh, ketoacidosis. So again, uh, previously in the, in the, in the uh, I mean the guidelines that we used in the past, uh, it was recommended uh, to discuss a child who has got a DKA with a senior doctor like a senior registrar or something. Now the new guidelines state uh, that you always consult with uh, the consultant pediatrician on call. Uh, for any child who, who you suspect to have a diabetic ketoacidosis, 
even if you are well trained even if you are quite confident in your anatomy you still need to consult the pediatrician on call preferably a pediatrician who has got some interest in diabetes but even if uh, let's say a general pediatrician on call uh, he should be definitely involved in the management right from the very first point uh, remember that management of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis uh, is a bit difficult so that's why it's always important to get a senior help right from the very first go so this is the third change uh, that uh, has been there in the best bad new uh, pediatric diabetic ketoacidosis guidelines now moving on to the uh, the fourth change the fourth change is regarding the resus fluids that we give so a child with diabetic ketoacidosis who is in shock and for shock we use the APLS criteria like uh, prolonged capillary refill time of more than two three seconds um, tachycardia low blood pressure so kids who are in clinical shock uh, based on the APLS guideline they should have a 20 mils per kg fluid bolus and that fluid bolus should go over 15 minutes so it's very important to give them a fluid bolus in the first 15 minutes only to those kids who are shocked and the other important thing is that these um, uh, fluid boluses the recess boluses they are not subtracted from the total fluid uh, calculation this is very important so the first thing is if a child is shocked with severe DKA as I said earlier that he is fulfilling the shock uh, criteria based on the APLS guidelines you have to give a 20 mils per kg fluid bolus uh, over 15 minutes so once you give it you would reassess if the child is getting better you will stop if the child is still um, shocked you will give another fluid bolus but that bolus would be 10 mils per kg so the first one is 20 the next one is 10 still if the child is shocked you will give a third fluid bolus and that third fluid bolus would all would also be 10 mils per kg so 20 mils per kg first bolus second bolus 10 mils per kg third bolus 10 mils per kg so 20 plus 10 plus 10 so that makes it 40 mils per kg of the total fluid recess balls so once if 40 mils per kg has been given now in clinical practice most of the kids they would be you know resuscitated by this amount of fluid but let's say in case if you get a child with severe DKA who you have given like 20 plus 10 plus 10 and still the child is shocked then they say that you have to stop here with fluid boluses and you have to consider inotropes so probably you would be thinking of uh, dopamine and dobutamine or another uh, pressure drugs to uh, you know um, increase the, the the blood pressure and give some circulatory support to the child so this is regarding uh, the recess fluids and an important thing is that these recess fluids are not subtracted please keep it under not subtracted from the total fluid uh, calculation so keep this in mind so this is the fourth change that has been adopted in the uh, British so uh, Society of Pediatric Endocrinology guidelines now coming uh, to uh, change number five so change number four was uh, regarding recess fluid uh, change number five is regarding bolus fluid so they say all children who have either mild moderate or severe DKA and if they are not in shock they still need to get a bolus fluid and that bolus fluid should be given over a period of one hour 60 minutes and that should be given um, according to 10 mils per kg body weight so you calculate the body weight of the child you multiply it by 10 and you give this bolus fluid over one hour for every child who has either got mild moderate or severe uh, ketoacidosis without shock and since this is the criteria for fluids without shock therefore this fluid is subtracted from the total fluid calculation so this fluid that you will give over one hour this would be calculated from the total fluids that have to be given to the child in the coming 24 to 48 hours so this is uh, important the other thing is they say if a child is well i mean if he's clinically well he's not vomiting he hasn't got any symptoms but he is, has got diabetic ketoacidosis in that case oral fluids are preferable but any child who's vomiting then you have to go irrespective of whether he's got mild moderate or uh, severe you have to stop oral fluids and you have to give iv fluids because you have to keep a very strict uh, calculation of how much fluid is going in and how much is going out so if they are tolerating oral fluids you give them oral fluids 
and uh, you reassess them uh, you know frequently because even if they are getting oral fluids it's important to check ketone levels every now and then so that you know that the ketone levels are falling so this is important number two if they've got vomiting and majority of them have got some form of vomiting then you stop oral fluids you start them on polus fluid so the first thing is that you give a uh, 10 mils per kg polus over one hour and then you subtract it from the rest of the fluid calculation so this is very important okay now moving on to uh, change number six and seven and eight and these are regarding maintenance fluids so uh, when uh, you know it's fluid management is very important in DKA so fluid management basically means that you have to give maintenance fluids plus deficit fluid so deficit fluid means those fluids which have been lost because of vomiting or because of you know fast breathing or small breathing and sensible losses so how we do that mild if you have categorized somebody as mild DKA so they have got five percent fluid loss if they have got uh, if you classify them as moderate decay, they have lost 7% of the, the fluids. Or if they are severe, then it means 10. So you can do the math. So let's say if somebody has got mild decay, it means they've lost 5%. So you multiply that 5% with their body weight and you will get the amount of fluid that has been lost and that is the deficit. Okay, for moderate, you will multiply the body weight with 7%. And for severe, you will multiply the body weight with 10%. And that way you calculate the uh, deficit fluid. And for maintenance fluid, we use the same what uh, we call as the holiday Sager formula. So it's again like 100 mils per kg for the first 10 kilograms, then 50 mils per kg for the next, like between 11 and 20. And then afterwards, like from 21 kg onward, you use uh, 20 mils per kg. But you know some kids would be very heavy so we have to use the cutoff of 80 kilogram because if a child is let's say 100 kilogram you cannot go like you know uh, for a fluid level which is even more than the adults so you if the if the child is a big one you will still stop at 80 kilogram or what we call as a 97th centile for age uh, whatever is his weight if you plot it on the uh, weight chart whichever is lower so either the 97th centile for his age or the 80 kilogram whichever is lower so you have to stop over there so fluid deficit multiplied by body weight would give you the total fluid deficit and maintenance fluids uh, 100 mils for, per kg for the first 10 kilograms 50 mils per kg for the next 10 kilograms and afterwards for every kilogram you add 20 mils per kg and then you add maintenance fluids plus deficit fluids minus the initial bolus that you give either for mild, moderate and severe and whatever value you get, you divide it by 48 and then you have to, you know, replenish these fluids over the next 48 hours. So this is very important that you rehydrate the child slowly over the next 48 hours. Okay, so this is very important. Uh, moving on to um, the other changes. Change number nine is regarding uh, potassium maintenance. And they say that all fluids, except the one that you have given in the beginning, so the recess fluids, like the 20 mils plus 10 plus 10, if you have given that, or the initial 10 mils per kg for mild, moderate, and uh, severe, you know, that has to go over one hour, that should never contain potassium. Never, never contain potassium. The rest of the fluids can have 40 millimoles per liter of potassium chloride added to them. Uh, but remember if a child let's say because you will be doing a venous blood gas uh, at the initial presentation at the very beginning if the patient has got a high uh, serum potassium then you do not add please keep it in mind you do not add potassium unless and until they have passed urine so they are clearly you know uh, they've got a clear tyresis or number two the potassium level is back within the normal range that is 3.5 to 5.5 so if high potassium wait till the child is passing urine the number two if the potassium level uh, is back within the uh, normal range so this is important if that is not do not add potassium and simply wait okay because it's important if the child is not passing urine and you add uh, potassium to it so uh, they can have uh, you know complications of high potassium so this is the change number nine in the new bs pet tk guidelines 2020 okay uh moving on change number 10 is regarding insulin 
And again, they said it's business as usual over here. So you never give insulin boluses. Insulin has to be given as a continuous infusion. And they say most of the kids would require uh, 0 0.05 units per kilogram per hour. Now, this is likely to be sufficient in most of the cases. We have to go or you have to go according to your local policy. But they say like on as a rule of thumb, most of the cases, most of the cases would be 0 0.05 per kilogram per hour. So this is your insulin requirement in most of the cases. But if somebody needs more of this blood sugar is quite high, it's not uh, coming down, you know, at, at the rate which you would be expecting, then in that case, you can also start them on 0 0.1 unit per kg per hour. But again, as I said, that would be a bit unusual. Most of the times, just 0 0.05 kilogram per hour is more than sufficient. Uh, to bring the sugar uh, back slowly and gradually back into the uh, normal range. And once uh, it comes down to normal, then you can start considering a long acting um, subcutaneous insulin along with intravenous insulin infusion. So that is change number 10. So uh, that was all about the, um, you know, the recent uh, changes in the management of pediatric uh, diabetic guidelines so in a nutshell or to summarize to remember the diagnostic criteria has changed so now instead of using a cutoff levels of 18 millimoles of bicarbonate we are using the 15 millimoles per liter uh, cutoff level and with that you need to have a ketone levels of more than 3 millimoles per liter and a child may have or may not have high blood sugar so blood sugar level is not that much important what is important is the bicarbonate level less than 15 millimoles the ph should be less than 7.3 and number three or uh, the um, and the ketone level should be uh, more than three millimoles per liter so if this criteria is fulfilled the child is classified as diabetic ketoacidosis and as i said the uh, rest of the changes are regarding fluids so now uh, those kids who are in shock and you for that use the APLS criteria so if they are in shock you will give the 20 mils per kg followed by two additional boluses of 10 mils per kg if needed and these fluids are not subtracted mind you they are not subtracted from the total fluid calculation for the rest of the kids who are not shocked if they are mild or moderate or severe they get a 10 mils per kg uh, fluid uh, over uh, 60 minutes and this fluid is subtracted from the deficit fluids and uh, rest of the fluid you have to calculate the maintenance fluid that would be again 100 mils for the first uh, per kg for the first 10 kg 50 mils for the next 10 kg and 20 mils per kg for uh, rest of the uh, you know the kilograms added to the body weight and uh, the cutoff level is 80 kilograms with that you add the uh, deficit fluids and for mild it is five percent of the body weight uh, for moderate it's seven percent for severe it's ten percent you add them together you will minus any uh, you know the uh, the fluid boluses that you gave over 60 minutes and whatever you are left with you have to replenish that over 48 hours so you just divide that total fluid over 48 and you will get the hourly rate and then as i said insulin has to be started uh, at uh, most of the time it would be 0 0.05 units per kg per hour and um, once it's going back then you can consider subcutaneous long-acting insulin along with iv insulin so these were for a few of the changes that uh, we have uh, you know have we have started practicing uh, and which have been recommended by the british society of pediatric endocrinology so thank you very much for watching uh, my uh, video if there are any questions or queries uh, you can put down a link below and i will be more than happy to answer your questions thank you very much have a good day bye